This is John Stewart, Green Lantern of Sector 2814, and you are listening to Geek Talk. This is Professor Charles Xavier. There are more powerful mutants out there, but they are listening to Geek Talk. What's up, everybody? It's Brad Hawkins, Ryan Steele from VR Troopers. We are VR, and you're tuned in to Geek Talk. This is Dr. Egghead. How am I supposed to conquer the world and build the Eggman Empire if they're always listening to Geek Talk? Hedgehog! This is the Didact. Humanity's imprisonment is a kindness, but not while listening to Geek Talk. This is Ryu from Wreck-It Ralph, and you're listening to Geek Talk. Hello, Ken! This is Marek Ishtar. Let the shadow game begin! You're listening to Geek Talk. This is Juno Eclipse. I've got a bad feeling about this, but you're listening to Geek Talk. This is Commodore Don Krieg of One Piece. Don't ever defy me. Listen to Geek Talk. That is an order. Hi, this is Greg Weissman. I was the creator and one of the producers of Gargoyles, and you're listening to Geek Talk. Hey, it's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm Master Plo Koon, and I sense the force is strong with Geek Talk. Master Plo, uh, do you talk geek? Koto ya, Obi-Wan. Koto ya. Oh, Koto ya, indeed. Now, if anybody else can figure out what he's talking about, let's listen to Geek Talk. Today, we're here on with my guest and a guest host also for this interview, Greg Wiseman, and I got Dr. G from Swag 77. Yay! More fanfare! <laughs> Greg, I would like yes. to congratulate you on 20 years of Gargoyles to start off. Well, thank you. I mean, you get great. a fanfare for that one, too. <laughs> I mean, that would be where I'm going to start today is Gargoyles, because how did you come up with the idea of Gargoyles? Uh. Well, uh, I've always been fascinated with gargoyles, um, going back to high school, um, there's just something about the, you know, the very limited legend that exists, which is you put these scary things up on your buildings to scare away evil spirits, and there was something sort of so, um, contradictory about that idea but it just always fascinated me. Like, why would you think that would be a good idea? Like, why would you put monsters up to scare away monsters? Wouldn't monsters want to bring monsters? I mean, it didn't quite... It didn't seem automatic to me. So I tried, um, when we did start developing the show, um, to think about what the rationale might be if you extrapolated backwards. Like, okay, right. if you put up monsters, stone monsters now, because once upon a time... There used to be this race of creatures, actual creatures, living beings, who would sit on our walls and would protect us. So now we're not quite sure why we... We don't remember exactly why, but we just know it's a good idea to have scary monsters up on the wall. Um, and that was the basic idea that fascinated me. And then in terms of developing the show specifically, uh, it really begins uh, with Disney's Adventures of the Gummy Bears. Um, which was a show that I uh, had nothing to do with creating or developing. Um, I did, uh, in the last season or two, um, work on it a little bit as a development executive, as a current programming executive. But um, this was a show created by Jim Magon, a phenomenally talented guy who also uh, created or co-created Tailspin um, and other shows, DuckTales and, and others. Um, and uh, we always thought Gummy Bears was this fantastic show, and we thought it didn't get enough respect. I mean, here was this original property on the air, doing great, and and it didn't get any respect. And, and mostly we thought that was because there was a confusion with uh, Care Bears. They both had right. colored bears, but Care Bears was this sort of saccharine, sweet show um, and Gummy Bears had this rich medieval setting and this rich backstory and all this great mythology that Jim had built into it. Um, and um, But it was literally named after candy. So you had the one show that really was sickeningly sweet, 
and then the other show, which was great, but named after a candy. You're right. And so we thought there was a lot of confusion between those two shows. So we very consciously set out to create a show that was in the gummy bears mode. That is, it was we're talking about adventure comedy with a rich medieval backstory that we thought would get more respect. So the first thing we did is instead of it being cute little multicolored bears, we decided to do cute little multicolored gargoyles. Um, and yeah, they the were thing quite multicolored. <laughs> right. And the second thing was we decided that though the backstory would be in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, um, that the actual series would be set in the present. So we came up with the idea of them being asleep for a thousand years and waking up in modern-day Manhattan. And, but it was a comedy show with cute little characters. Um, and there was adventure, but it was still comedy. And so we pitched that to Michael Eisner, who was the head of the Walt Disney Company at the time, and he passed. He didn't like it. But we just still thought there was, both my bosses and I thought there was something in this. Um, and so we sort of went back to the drawing board. And I actually went to another one of Disney TV Animation's, you know, great founding fathers, uh, in addition to Jim Magon, is a guy named Tad Stones, who created Darkwing Duck and co-created Rescue Rangers, and um, and I showed our pitch to Tad, and Tad looked at it, and Tad didn't really work on Gargoyles other than this one day, but it was a very important day, because Tad said, well, you know, Beauty and the Beast is about to come out, and um, you know, what if instead of having a bunch of little gargoyles, you had one big gargoyle? And that really sparked something in me because my background actually is in comic books and superheroes. So um, the one character that didn't exist in the old comedy development was any equivalent to Goliath. Right. So um, we created Goliath. Uh, Greg Buehler and I created Goliath. And um, um, and then we took the entire rest of the show and put it through the prism of Goliath. And so we wound up with... Um, this action drama on the other end. Um, and it's a longer story, but basically that's what they bought and that's what they went for. And suddenly we were making a, a show. Now, I think the comedy show was a great show. It would have been a lot of fun. But I'm very glad it worked out the way it did because I think, you know, the longevity of the Gargoyles is, is in a large part due to its depth of field, so to speak. And... Um, and I think we were able to do that much more effectively with the with the action drama than we would have been with the comedy adventure. Right, and that's pretty good. I mean, it's been going on for years. It's still played today on, like, a late night and stuff. I don't think so, but it's well, still available. You can all the DVDs of the first two seasons, both uh, season one and both volumes of season two, are available for sale, um, and uh, you can also get it online. Um, through iTunes, that kind of thing, I think. Um, right, I, I think you could get it until, at. Until, I think until, I think it was playing non-stop in reruns um, until uh, just a, a couple of years ago, but I think a couple of years ago they pulled it off their late night schedule. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have I don't have cable, so it's been a while since I've had late night TV like that. So... And then I've also been catching up on this a little bit. I actually was watching the, oh, I'm trying to think here. I know, uh, Roughnecks, the Starship Troopers saga. I actually watched your, watched those, the shows that you actually wrote. And yeah, I wrote a couple. Were you going the story kind of the book? And then I wrote a couple. Were you guys going off the book then for that, or were you just going off of, like, the movies type thing? Both. Um, Both? You know, we all went back and read the book, and we brought stuff back into the show that wasn't in the movies from the book. But we also used the material that the movie created um, as well. So we uh, we were doing something new and original. It wasn't in continuity with the movies, but we borrowed from both sources. Yeah, see, I actually, when I was watching, I was like, Johnny Rico wasn't, with what they were saying, wasn't that part of the movies? <laughs> so. Uh, like I said, we borrowed elements of Johnny from both the movies and the book. 
and we created some stuff too. So. Right, and that was a, those were very good episodes. I actually enjoyed them. So, well, thank you. And then also, I actually started catching up on this. Is you produced Young Justice? That's true. Uh, and when <laughs> you guys were doing that, were you guys going off of like the young? kids like say the teen titan type thing or uh you know we were going going off of the entire dc universe so you're talking 75 years of continuity um now a lot of our most primary influences uh came from the uh 1960s late 60s early 70s uh teen titan titles um more so than the more recent new teen titans because we felt that the uh television show Teen Titans had been based largely off of New Teen Titans. So we actually went back even earlier than that. And then also, we borrowed stuff from the Young Justice comic that was written by Peter David, who also wrote a few episodes for us. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we borrowed from Justice League, we borrowed from, you know, uh, a Red Tornado miniseries that I wrote that never got made. <laughs> um, and all sorts of other sources, you know, Swamp Thing, uh, you know, anything that from the DC Universe was fair game, and we weren't shy about, you know, uh, season two, we borrowed a lot from the Blue Beetle title, um, and uh, we weren't shy about taking stuff from anywhere that seemed fun and worked, and we just tried to create a cohesive version of the DC Universe for our series. Um, with a long timeline that I created and worked up with uh, my partner on the show, Brandon Pietti. And, um, uh, you know, we had a blast. We got two seasons out of it, which we got more. We yeah, that would have been good. It would have been a good idea to have more than one season, I mean. And then something else, too, is were you a comic book fan before you did some of these shows like Young Justice and stuff? Yeah, I mean all my life basically uh, but you know I worked in comics before I worked in animation um, I wrote Captain Adam for years for DC um, and I was actually on staff at DC Comics for a couple of years in my 80s um, so yeah I mean my comic book background goes uh, back way farther than my animation background even and I've been doing animation for over two decades now as well so. right and what would be your oh, favorite yeah. what would be your favorite superhero when you were doing stuff like that or even Black Canary okay Black Canary yeah that's a pretty mm -hmm. good character I mean I've never really paid she's my all she's my all time favorite superhero well that is very good and then you've all you also I actually did get to watch the Superman Shazam movie at one point. It's a the DC showcase shorts. And that was actually a really good move show that you actually did. So I didn't do that. I did uh the Green Arrow short. Oh okay. But I so. didn't do Superman and, and uh, Captain Marvel. Okay. That's pretty cool. So, and then you also did a, wrote a couple episodes for Batman the Brave and the Bold. Yes, I did. I wrote at least two, maybe three, I'm trying to think. I'm looking on a IMDb, it says that you, it was three, basically. Two, two rope, and then you did the story of the powerless, so. Okay. That's right. So. Yeah, I mean, that was a, um, a lot of fun to work on, um with uh, Michael Jelinek and um, he's terrific and, and that show is so much fun so I had a good time working on Unbreakable and then you also actually had I we actually had Phil Lamar here recently and he was actually on Kim Possible and you actually were a writer on two episodes of Kim Possible 
Yes. Now I feel like you're just going down IMDb. Well, <laughs> no, some, I'll, be, all the things I'll like be switching but everything. Yeah, I, I wrote a couple of Kim Possibles for uh, Bob Schooley and Mark McCorkle. Uh, I wrote one called uh, Queen Beebe, where I don't actually think I did a very good job. I, I, I didn't quite have the tone of the show, but they did a great job in sort of fixing it. And then I felt I did a better job on uh, uh, Big Bother. Um, where I, I, by that time, sort of keyed in and understood the show better, and I think I, I think I did a better job on that one. I feel I feel pretty proud of how that one turned. Right, and then I also noticed you've actually going back kind of gar- to Gargoyles is you actually announced have you got some books coming out of Gargoyles? I believe, don't uh, you? Or are the comic we, books? We we did Gargoyles comics with SLG. Um, which were then collected into three trade paperbacks, Plan Building Volume 1, uh, Gargoyles Plan Building Volume 2, and Gargoyles Bad Guys. Uh, and I'm very proud of those 18 issues, which are collected into those three trades. Even the trades are out of print now, so they're a little difficult to get, but, um, you know, you can get them. Um, but I, you know, would love to do more Gargoyles comic books and talks are ongoing about getting that going again. So you are looking to work on getting gargoyles more going? Always. I literally never stop trying to do more gargoyles. Um, but, the, the, you know, we had a shot for about 18 issues a couple of years or three years probably um, back in 2009-ish. Uh, and, uh, and I haven't given up. I haven't ever given up trying to do more gargoyles in one medium or another. Right. And I myself, and something is, do you also look to do more superhero stuff? or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I love that stuff. I did Spider-Man for Sony and Marvel uh, and uh, Kids WB and later for Disney XD. Um, and that was a blast. We did some seasons of Spectacular Spider-Man. And then I did two seasons of Young Justice. It's also a lot. And I love those characters. I grew up with those characters. Um, it was a lot of fun to do. And yeah. So I'd be so thrilled to do more of that. Yeah, and I, I myself noticed you can't. They had in some of the writing of the of the creatures that you came up with was like mind control creatures on Young Justice. I kind of was watching that the other day and. It was pretty cool seeing that come up. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun elements in Young Justice. Uh, almost all of them brought out from one corner or another of the DC universe. Um, you know, we had Star, our version of Star of the Conqueror, and we had Star of Tech, which could be used to control people. We had all sorts of different methods of control. It was one of the uh, one of the go-to things for us was mind control, um, you know, programming, deep programming, and cloning, and all sorts of different things. But you know, it it was a lot of fun. We got to do a great breadth of material, but also get into some depth on our characters. And that's the stuff that you know I like to see the two things. Yeah, and that's pretty cool. And it actually made up to be a very good show, from what I've watched on Netflix. So. And then I know Gina has a couple questions for you. Yes, yes. Um, so I come from Swag 77 that star, I own that actually. <laughs> and, uh, it stands for Star Wars Actors Guild 77. And we tell stories on social media. We portray a lot of characters. You might know some of them. Cause I know we've been talking to you. <laughs> On, t- on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, we just uh, read, write, and perform fan fiction, and that involves a lot of work on our behalf. And, but it keeps young people safe and productive on social media. That's what we uh, have shown. And I know that we can't ask specifics on Star Wars. That's okay. That we can ask about your process of production and writing in general, if that's okay with you. Sure. 
Yeah, so I was, you got degrees from Stanford and USC? That's right. Wow. And so that really launched your career into writing and production and all the great things that we're seeing, right? I don't know if it launched my career. I mean, um, uh, I think uh, it absolutely is the backbone of my uh, um, ability to function <laughs> as a writer. Um, I couldn't have done it without this amazing education I got in high school, college, and graduate school. But, um, you know, I don't think it helped me get any jobs. I mean, uh, I it, it was nice to have on the resume, and I think, you know, the first job I got at Disney, one of the things that my boss, Gary Chrysler, sort of liked about my resume is that on the one hand, um, I did have this great liberal arts education. I'd gone to Stanford. I uh, studied in Oxford. I was, at the time, attending USC graduate school at night. Um, and um, so he knew I had this really good background in the liberal arts and in the great works and those sort of things. Um, but at the same time, what he liked was that I had also worked in comic books for years. So he knew that, particularly since he was thinking of, of sending me over to Disney TV animation, he knew that you know, since I worked in comics, I wasn't going to look down my nose at working in cartoons. And I wouldn't, of course, because I love cartoons. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think it was sort of that combination, but it's not like I ever got a job through Stanford or through USC. I'm sure there are people who do, um, but that never happened for me. Um, mostly, I most of the jobs I've gotten, I've had to go out and get them by writing something and showing people that I could do it or by them looking at the last thing I did and saying, wow, that was cool, let's get this guy. Um, and, you know, but I've worked at a lot of different places. Um, to some extent, it's the nature of the beast, but I didn't realize that when I started. You know, when I was at Disney for seven years, up until probably the last six months, I thought that I would end my career there, you know, I'd just stay there for another 20 years. Um, but, you know, it's just not the nature of the beast, and you wind up bopping around. I've been freelance since 1998. I yeah, to Disney to be on staff at DreamWorks for um, nearly three years, and then from DreamWorks I went freelance, and I've been freelance ever since. Like Young Justice, Spider Man, uh, Star Wars Rebels, everything I've done since 1998 has been freelance, which mm -hmm. means you never quite have a home. You know, you have places you stop for a while on the journey, but you never quite have a home, and they're advantages and disadvantages to that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that sounds, you, basically I ask that because most of the people that I work with are young people and they're starting out in their lives and you're like, stay in school. <laughs> well, I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I'm a former English teacher uh, and, um, you know, I couldn't be the writer I am without um, the great teachers I've had both in high school and college over the years. Um, you know, my high school English teachers, you know, um, you know Mrs. Wardlaw, Mr. McGrew, um, Dr. Johnson, you know, my college teachers like Ron Rebholt, uh, Albert Carrard, um, and uh, Nancy Packer, and... Um, and in grad school, um, Digby Wolf and um, Hubert Selby Jr., some of these people have passed away since then, but these were phenomenal teachers that I had um, throughout, you know, those years, and um, they taught me so much. But, you know, the key thing is reading, really. Um, you know, Can you, you wait, wait, wait? You should be reading. Can you say that a lot louder and repeat it like ten times for me? <laughs> read, read, read. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, uh, the the way to be a great writer is to be a great reader. Um, it's also to be a great listener. You want to, you know, if you're sitting in McDonald's or wherever, you know, shut up for a minute and just listen to people talk. You know, because 
that's the way people really talk, and that's how your dialogue should play. Uh, um, but fundamentally, it's about reading, and it's not just about reading the stuff that comes out now. Whether it's good or bad, that's great. But you need to go back and read classic literature. I'm a huge Shakespeare fanatic. You know, um, Homer. Uh, Odyssey. Beowulf, <laughs> um, you know, all this stuff. Um, Charles Dickens, William Faulkner. Go back and read the stuff that's really stood the test of time. Um, and don't just read stuff from Western culture, you know. Read great Japanese novels or... or Gilgamesh! Um, Chinese mythology. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Keep um, going. Keep and, going. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's that's what you need to do because um, if, if you're basing all your writing on the latest movie from, uh, you know... Trailer. <laughs> in, you know, Inception or, or, you know, it doesn't matter how great the movie is. If all you're working off of is the most recent stuff, and in essence, you know, you're not getting down to the true archetypes. You're, you're, you're making a copy of a copy. Um, and or game. And watered <laughs> down over time. Yeah. Basically, just kind of like the go back to like say the old Shakespeare type stuff, even if you need to. That's kind of standard, well, I, right? I, well, I make use of Shakespeare personally all the time because I am a huge fanboy yeah. when it comes to Shakespeare. So you know, there's tons of Shakespeare and gargoyles, there's Shakespeare and spectacular Spider-Man, um, there's Shakespeare and pretty much everything I've done ever. Mm-hmm. Because I love it. You know, I've written two novels, um, Reign of the Ghosts and Spirits of Ash and Tone. Um, these are set on a Caribbean island um, in modern day, but they're full of, um, you know, uh, mythology of the Taino people, which is this rich mythology that almost nobody is aware of. Everyone's heard about the Greek myths and the Norse myths and Thor and mm-hmm. everything, and even the Egyptian myths. But there's a great wealth of mythology that, that just isn't prevalent in pop culture. And one of the things that was great about writing these novels is I was able to take these great stories and sort of do a modern take on that mythology. But then, you know, it's also a Caribbean island, so I threw the Tempest in there as well because I love Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But reading, say that again, because I've been getting hell for that. <laughs> I can't imagine you getting help with that. Who would argue at that point? <laughs> oh, you would be amazed. You would be amazed. I don't understand it myself, but it's like, wow. Because I went to graduate school, too, and they said I went for another reason, which was biology or molecular biology, and my professor said, read all the literature. I'm like, which one? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of what they do. <laughs> so, so I was like, read all the literature, read as much as you can, and and yeah, I love, I love that. I love that you say that. I'm gonna like make loops <laughs> over and over a bit again. <laughs> so, um, can you talk a little bit about you know when you go into production? You um, how much time does it really take to get a pro? You know you know you're going to do this project, then create it and then get it out. Just in general. Uh, well, you know from start to finish, you you have uh, X amount of time to develop a show. Um, you know, some shows are original, like Gargoyles was. Uh, other shows, you're basing it on existing material, whether that's the DC Universe or that we did in Young Justice or the Spider-Man corner of the Marvel Universe like we did for Spectacular Spider-Man. Uh, and you're just trying to figure out who are your lead characters, what are the dynamics between them. And that takes months sometimes. Um, but then at some point, you get a green light or... I shouldn't make it sound like that's a given. That's hard to get. But once you get a green light, if you get a green light, um, then, you know, the next step is, for me, is uh, building a season. Now, a lot of shows don't do this, but for the shows that I produce, I build the entire season in advance, um, you know, and I do that 
with a very primitive method. It's not high tech. It's about me getting out a bunch of index cards on bulletin board and writing fragments of ideas or you know lines of dialogue or uh, whatever and putting each of those things on its own index card and then you know putting them in order on the board with you know push pins and sharpies and index cards and um, and that's how I build a season at a time um, so that in essence uh, what I do which is somewhat different from most showrunners I think is I submit an entire season's worth of premises for approval in advance. And that takes weeks um, to put together that season and write up the premises and submit them and get them approved. Then the next step in the process is to bring in um, freelance writers, uh, if you've got them, staff writers, and um, you hand out these premises. And what's nice for the writer, and I know this because I've been on the other side since I'm a freelancer myself, but on the other side of the desk, is that the writer comes in and they and he or she knows they're getting a story. They don't have to pitch 15 ideas in the hopes that one of them interests the producer. I'm giving them the story idea. And we talk through the story. Usually I have writers' meetings where we do three or four stories, so there are like four writers in the room, um, and each one knows they're getting one of these four stories. So they're all willing to pitch in on everyone else's because they pitch in on the other three guys and they know the other three guys are going to pitch in on theirs as well. So we get a lot of help in, in coming up with great ideas for each story. Um, and then they go off and they have about two weeks to write an outline. Or at least the first guy has about two weeks and the second guy probably has three and the third guy probably has four because I can't edit all these outlines simultaneously anyway. Um, but in essence, they have two weeks to write the thing. Uh, it comes back to me. Uh, I do a, a, a pass on it, and uh, I edit the outline, and then I send it out to the bosses to get their approval. Um, it comes back hopefully in 48 hours, but usually in a week. Um, and then the writer sent a script with the notes that we got from uh, the outline. And they usually have about between eight days, that's the minimum I try to give everybody, uh, and three weeks to write the script. It comes back to me. I, again, do a pass on it. Um, it, again, goes out for notes. Um, it comes back with notes, and I usually, hopefully by that time, we're all on the same page, so I usually do the rewrite overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and then we record it. You know, we record the episode all in a day. Um, and then it goes for boarding and design. So um, that process takes between usually four and six weeks. Um, and then there's directing time and um, all sorts of, you know, approvals and this kind of thing. And then it goes overseas to be animated. Which mm -hmm. can, That's again, standard. Six to eight weeks. Um, and uh, comes back. And has to go through post production. So we edit the show. Um, the show is scored. We add the music. We add the sound effects, um, and we edit. We mix the show, and and then we put out the finished product. So if you add all that time up for any one episode, from premise to finished product, it's probably about ten months. Um, wow. When you throw in the fact that you're not making one episode, you're making That's... 13 or you're making 26 or something. Yeah. Like you're talking about something that, and, and you add in the development time, you're talking about something that usually is taking a couple of years for a season. And for usually a season, going, well, people. You get, for, <laughs> you get a pick up partway through the production of the first season for the second season, so those two things overlap. So you don't have a two-year gap between the seasons, mm -hmm. um, but you know that was often I find particularly on the internet that you know people are like, uh, "Hey, uh, if you got the go ahead now, could we have more Young Justice by September?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> no. I mean, even assuming we got the go ahead, you know, we need a minimum of ten months." Yeah, um, and. Uh, 
executives can change their mind too you know you know it it, animation is a long process it's a much longer process than live action live action if they get the their approvals they can just get up shoot the damn thing and and post it and it's relatively quick Mm -hmm. Um, but animation is a very long process yeah that's what it seemed like and we've we saw a lot of um on on all the accounts that we hold, we saw all kinds of things, and we're like, "You really don't understand production, do you?" <laughs> and <laughs> there was some ridiculous stuff, but it's like those outlines. I had that question about the outlines. How how long are those? Are they like five pages, ten pages, dissertation level? <laughs> um. We shoot for uh, somewhere in the area of eight. Okay. Um, you know, page for the teaser and two or three pages for each of three acts. Mm-hmm. So it's around eight. Um, I tend to write long, um, which is not a good thing um, mm-hmm. because ultimately the episode's 22 minutes long. So if, you know, you write long, something's going to have to get cut. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like suddenly, oh, I wrote this great story in a 12-page outline and it's not like suddenly the episode is 40 minutes long. You know, the episode's still only 22 minutes long. Mm-hmm. So um, it's best to write tight. But I'm not actually very good at writing tight, so I tend to write a little long. Um, and uh, so sometimes my outlines are more like 10 pages or something like that. But uh, we shoot for eight. Yeah. And so that's a part of the negotiation and the back and forth that you have to do in the editing process of when you write your scripts, right? Well, yeah, I mean, from a script standpoint, um, these days, I mean, when I started on Gargoyles, our scripts were 40, 41 pages, and the goal was to get it down to 39. Okay. Um, and nowadays, if I turned in a 39-page script, people would look at me like I was insane, and, and they say, can you give me a 29-page script? And I'm like, no but I can shoot for 33, you mm-hmm. know. If I can get it down to 33, I feel pretty confident that eight or nine times out of ten, it's going to be the right length. Okay. And a couple of times it'll be a little long, and once in a while it'll be short. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I write very dense, and, and I produce very shows that have a lot of meat to them. They're very dense. They, mm-hmm. they have a lot of content. They stuff a lot of content on screen um, with a lot of ideas and a lot of characters and, and all sorts of stuff. And I have found ways to do that economically. I don't mean cost-wise, I mean time-wise. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that allow me to get a lot into a relatively short 22-minute episode, but I can't do that on a 29-page script. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, one of the things you don't want to do is, you know, you're only allowed to send so much footage to be animated, so if the show comes out long, it's not going to be long um, in terms of footage. It's going to be long uh, in terms of the storyboard, and so you wind up having to cut the storyboard down, and what that means is that you wasted the storyboard artist's time. You mm-hmm. wound, wound up drawing a lot of material. I mean, if it's too long, you'll wind up drawing a lot of panels of art that will never get seen and never get used, and that's not a great use of that board artist's time. So you want to make sure that you're more or less in the ballpark before the artist even gets it. Well, what I usually do is if my, you know, we record these scripts and we cut the recording down um, so we know how long the voice track is. Mm-hmm. And we have a basic target because you figure, well, action's going to take up X amount of time. So if the dialogue alone is taking up too long, um, you know we've got to cut some. And so then we try to make any cuts that are necessary before the board artist sees it, but we're making those cuts based on hard information because we know how long the vocal track is as opposed to sort of vaguely going, well, I think this is too long or I think this is short. We kind of have a a clearer idea. Mm -hmm. But we really try to do that before the artist starts drawing the storyboard um, because we don't want to waste his or her time on uh, drawing stuff that's never going to get seen or used. But it costs us no more to record 
you know, 14 minutes of dialogue than it does to record 13 or 15. That's the exact same price. Yeah. It's the exact same one day of recording. So it's okay to record a little long, but it's not okay to send that recording to the board artist long. Yeah. I have a question, though. This is a side question that I ask a lot of authors and... I've never asked a, sh a producer like you or a showrunner like you, so I just want to know for my own um, information is when you put your story together and say, hey, this is the script I'm going with, you get all the approvals and everything, and you're ready to send it over to the storyboard artists and stuff, how do you know it's going to resonate with the audience? before you do all of that? Well, to some degree, you have to trust your instincts. I mean, you know, if you... What I always do on any of my shows uh, is I write to my passion. Um, and then I just... All I'm doing is crossing my fingers that other people will like what I like. Um, it doesn't do any good to try the other way around. You know, if you're not writing to your passion, if you're just simply trying to guess at what other people are looking for and are liking, and you're not actually enjoying what you're writing, then what you write will be passion-free. Um, and that means that almost by definition, it's going to suck. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't give a damn about what you're working on, how can you possibly expect anyone else to? Mm -hmm. Now, the flip isn't necessarily true. Just because you love it doesn't mean someone else will, but at least there's a shot at it. Yeah. If you love it and your work is full of passion and that passion speaks clearly, hopefully it'll reach the passions of other people. And so far I've been good enough or lucky enough or some combination of the two to um, on shows like Gargoyles and Spider-Man and um, Star Wars Rebels and Young Justice and other things I've done that that's been the case, that... I wrote the stuff that I would want to see if I was the viewer, and enough of the audience agreed that we did. We it came out pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's still the key. If if I'm not liking what I'm writing, there's almost no chance anyone else will. If mm -hmm. I do like it, there's no guarantee anyone else will. But at least there's a chance that you, based on your passion. So have passion, people. Choose yeah, the dark I mean, side. No. <laughs> so, and I, I do have uh, one last question after that, but you can go, Tony. And one of the things is, what would be have been your favorite subject back in school and high school? Uh, my favorite was English. I liked history too. I uh, liked math through algebra, and then once it got into trig, I got. <laughs> Let alone calculus, I got lost. But um, and I was never much of a science student either. I'm not. Uh, hey, no, I'm, just <laughs> saying, I'm just saying that you know I wasn't that good at it. You know, my son is great at math and science, and it impressed a lot of me. Um, but my daughter was, you know, more like me and more of an, an English uh, student. Um, you know, but I loved English. I loved history. Um, and uh, those were pretty much my favorite subjects in school. And I loved, in theory, I wanted to be great at languages. I really always did, but I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was no good at I took Spanish, I took Hebrew, I took French, I took even took Latin for a little while. Um, I was just never any good at it. Um, but I really wanted to be. Yeah, <laughs> right? well. And I am kind of jealous about somebody you went to school with. And that was Broncos great John Elway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't know him, uh, but yeah, we were <laughs> in school at the same together. Time. He, was, <laughs> uh, he was a great quarterback. He, gra he was a year ahead of me, so he graduated uh, my junior year of college. Oh, okay. But, you know, he was a great quarterback, and um, but the school was just big enough that I didn't actually know him personally. Although the girl I was dating at the time actually. Uh, had him as a tutor for one of her, uh, not tutor, that's the wrong word, uh, teaching assistant for um, a psychology class that we were in, uh, just psych 101. Uh, but, you know, uh, I didn't personally ever 
know him, but you know, we always rooted for him. Uh, and I rooted for him. You know, I'm from Los Angeles, but I was a Broncos fan the whole time he was playing for Denver because, you know, we loved LA. Yeah. yeah. And I myself am a Broncos fan and been so free. He likes now. the bronies. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I have, I have one question. It is a Star Wars question, but you can answer this one. This one's like nebulous. Um, out of all the ales that there are in the galaxy far, far away, which would you choose and why? Mandalorian ale? Carillion oh, oh. ale? Oh, ale. Ale. Ale as beer. <laughs> yeah. And Alderani. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't drink alcohol. So, that's uh, good. I, I, good for you. I, I am ignorant of all the uh, ales, period. Not just the uh, <laughs> far, far away ales, but all ales. So, well, there's, uh, three, there's three of them I choose, and those are the three. But, hey, it's all good. So, basically, that's where I myself don't drink that much, so I'm with you on the ales. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't admit that, so <laughs> I ain't going to say anything. <laughs> Anyway, I hope we answered, all, uh, we asked you safe questions and they were, and your answers were extraordinary for me. I really enjoyed them. Yeah, and oh, I loved you. the, I loved the gargoyle one, especially because the fact very few people actually really, that I know of, really go over much for the gargoyles. I mean, they know of them, but they don't go into much detail about them. So. Well, thanks. This has been a lot of fun. Well, I hope we had uh, actually gave you some laughs too at the same time. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, and definitely let me know when it's up and send me a link, and I'll tweet it up and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Keep up be... the good work. It's exciting to watch how you work on Twitter and you talk to people, and then you. Our, for our accounts, we, you know, you might not, you'd be like, why are their characters talking to me? I made that character. <laughs> 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 but that's kind of what we do on my side, so. Yeah, and me, for mine, I basically talk about pretty much anything, like the superheroes I talk about. I mean, pretty much everything like that. And one more thing I have to ask is, what do you think of the Saturday morning cartoons being taken down the way they have been? Well, I, I mean, what you're talking about is network Saturday morning cartoons being down. And, right. And uh, I think it's very sad. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm in my 50s, so I grew up with Saturday morning cartoons, and it was very exciting. You know, we'd watch at the beginning of the season, every Friday night, they'd have some special hosted by the Brady Bunch or whatever, about what the cartoons were going to be at the beginning of the season for Saturday morning. And, you know, and me and my sister and brother, we'd tune in and we'd watch all these shows and decide which ones we liked and which ones we were going to watch in that pre-BCR age when you had to actually choose um, which shows you were going to watch because if, once they aired, they were gone. You know, there wasn't any ability to uh, get them back. And it was very exciting. But, you know, it's a new age, and now their entire network's dedicated to children's programming all the time. Right. So I understand why the specificity of Saturday morning being less important to kids' programming when most kids can tune into Cartoon Network or Disney XD or um, Nickelodeon any day, any time, and get, and that's not even counting, you know, streaming and Netflix and all that kind of stuff. You can get kids programming any time, any minute of any day, and often on demand exactly what you're looking for. But I do think we lose something by not having that great collective Saturday morning as kids that we all watched these shows, um, you know, back when there were only two or three options, and again, when you either watched it or you missed it. Um, so I think it's sad, but I also think it's something that's been coming for a very, very long time. Um, one by one, the networks dropped out. 
Um, even in terms of Kids WB, you know, we had Spectacular Spider-Man on that network for a season, and we were doing very, very well, and then Kids WB went away. And so we did our second season on Disney XD. Suddenly we were on cable instead of being on broadcast. And um, So there's something sad about that, but, you know, it's been coming for such a long time, it's hard for me to get worked up about it. Um, right. Because it, it, it's not like... You know, it was reported as if it was this sudden thing. Oh, my God, there's no Saturday morning network television anymore. For right. I'm like, well, really, there hasn't been for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and there were just a couple of things that sort of were straggling along um, where really it wasn't even the network's programming it anymore. It was services or other companies that were... The networks had subcontracted to program their Saturday morning kid stuff. And mostly it had to be education driven to meet FCC requirements. And, um, and you know, so it wasn't necessarily the greatest situation anyway. So it's hard to get really worked up about it because it wasn't an overnight thing. It was a long, gradual decline. And it's sad, but it is what it is. Right. So, well, thank you for coming and talking with us, and it's yeah. been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to, uh, if you if you allow me to, one bit of indulgence, I just want to one more time. Uh, hey, you can promote my anything my you want. Two novels. Yeah, go um, ahead. <laughs> I've written two books, Reign of the Ghosts and Spirits of Ash and Foam. They're the first two books in what I hope to be a nine-book series. Um, so I really hope that, your readers will check those books out, um, and uh, I think they're really rich. If you like the work I've done on shows like Gargoyles and Rebels and uh, Young Justice, Spider-Man, I really do think you'll love these two books. Um, I had a great time writing them, and they're full of this rich kind of mythology like Gargoyles had. Um, and uh, Reading is important, too. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I really hope your your uh, readers will check out the. I mean, your listeners will check out this novel. Yeah. Hey, readers, listeners, they're both about the. They're going to be about the same here once because yeah. they actually also read the Star Wars books. So. Yeah. And so you no, know, they should read all the stuff, all the material. That's important. I mean, it's the way of life. Especially if you want to go and write. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. It was great talking to you guys. And uh, like I said, let me know when it's up, and I'll I'll uh, spread the word. All right. Sounds good. You All have right. a good Take one now. Easy.